I do deeply resent being saved by wild elves. Judging by their behavior, they are every horrible thing that I have ever believed them to be. They are dirty, unsophisticated, brutish. At first, they attacked the Srykreen Ma'ak. Like all weak things, they chose the easy target. So when I defended him, all present realized I was more worthy prey. I had forgotten I was one of them. But only half. I was only half one of them, but enough that they could see through me. I had fooled everyone, myself included, that I was of a purely human bloodline. Oh, how I hated them for reminding me that I was not. Oh, I wanted to destroy them for reflecting to me who I was. I was humiliated by the elves' exposure of me, and I could only hope that my new companions did not realize the implications of what they said. The rage choked me into paralysis, into forgetting all of my skills and tricks as they stripped us of what little we had. And as they disappeared over the dunes, I was filled with hatred for them and for me. You have been awake all day, and you know that you can't travel long before exhaustion overcomes you. So you might be able to make it to midnight, which is, at this point, maybe four hours in front of you. So you could get a few miles between you and the wagon heading southwest before you know that at least um, Desi and Zarn are going to need to rest. Ma'ak, you are constantly getting ahead of the group and having to pause and wait. Ahead, pause, wait as they catch up. And it is. It's it's really difficult. You can tell it's really difficult for him to hold himself back. And for you, uh, Desi, uh, you're just keeping pace with the group. And the sand is something you've never experienced before. The it, It's like having weights tied to your feet as you move through this. And really, you know, it would be the same experience for Boast as well. You just have the fortitude to notice it and move on. Mm, yeah, I keep on pushing forward. It is not all that different from what I went through in the, in the pits and in the arena. The physical exertion is somewhat similar, and there's no one that's trying to cut you down, so there's that. And uh, I keep carrying uh, Zarn and, and just moving forward through through the dunes. I mean, there's another shoulder here. If this is hard for Desi, can is it is it possible that most can lift two of us? Desi, as as difficult as this is. As much of a slog as it is to run through this deep sand, up and down these dunes, 50 feet, 75 feet, up and down, 100 feet, up and down, there's something exhilarating about it. There's something that awakens inside you, and you just want to run. And you kind of forget your exhaustion for a while it catches up to you after about an hour or so but at first as you cr- as you crest the first dune and you look out and the light of the twin moons of Athos is shining casting its blue light upon the dunes like waves like inanimate frozen waves on a lake, a pond. You wanna you wanna hit every single one of them. You wanna keep going. And you don't know why. Do you know at first I thought it was the fear, and then I thought it was the freedom. But when I think of sleeping, all I can hope is that I can wake up again to do the same thing tomorrow. So you get to 
hard to tell. You've been running for a couple hours. And then you hear Ma'ak, give me a survival check. All right, I, I only beat it by three. A sand howler has found you. So a sand howler is a desert-dwelling creature that hunts in packs. They are known for their terrible howls that they use to signal each other when tracking down their prey. Worse than their howls are their eight terrible eyes that are capable of paralyzing anyone who gazes upon them. Sand howlers are lizard-like creatures who resemble dogs except for their eight eyes. They have oversized heads in order to support their many eyes. They have large yellow tusks. Sand howlers are dark brown to light brown in color, though the rare ones have white skin. And typically, they have a single individual who goes out scouting, and when they find prey, they howl in the night, calling the pack to come hunt. Put me down. What was that? What was that? I put uh, Zarn down. Ma'ak, you know that you have some time before the pack shows. Because typically the, the first howler um, signals the rest. And then it could be some time before the pack arrives. The howl that we heard, though, do I know that as the... I found prey, howl. Oh yeah, that's the call of the pack. Have I or my pack ever fought one before? I assume we have. Individually, not too much of a problem. They are large. They're somewhere between a wild boar and a massive mastiff. They have a scaly back, like a razor ridge of scales down their spine. They have this massive head with seven eight inch tusks and then a line of razor teeth and then eight eyes all one above the other down the sides of their snouts and uh just massively muscled with huge talons one by itself because they're only about four feet in length is easy to deal with you know now that if you could locate that howler, you might be saved. But howlers are notorious for being hard to find. Unfortunately for the howler, I happen to be a telepath. With life detection. I'm not going to risk telepathy at this point. Um, I want to save my PSPs. But I will basically say, we'll find it. Kill fast. Or pack kill us. And I will then begin to meditate, or at least, you know, cl open my other awareness and begin to use the ability life detection to see if I can locate where this thing is. Uh, although, actually, no, in all fairness, it's only got a range of 100 yards. It probably, I probably would know if it was within 100 yards, right? Well, where you are currently right now, you are in the basin between two low-lying wave dunes, um, about 50 feet high. So um, it's not even, uh, it's not nearly 100 yards to the top. You know, because of the location you're in, you must have been spotted somewhere upon the crest of the dunes that currently surround you. All of okay. which were, are within 50 yards of you. Easy, at least. Well, then I can scan a wider space. If it's within 50 yards, I can do 90 degree arc at 60 yards, which is probably what I will do. And you get a general sense of the direction that the howl came from, so you can kind of guess at what 90 degree angle you should be looking fairly easily. So, Aaron, I rolled a two on my MAC roll, so I definitely made it. It's ahead of you, not behind you. It's up the dune, the direction you're going. I will point at that direction, and I will begin moving my full Thrykreen speed. 
basically charging in that general direction, although I would like to make a hunting roll to see if I can still sort of sneak up on it. Okay, so it is, um, the dune itself is about 50 feet high. You're about 50 yards from the peak. Um, If you did a five times run, yeah, you can easily make it because 50 yards is 150 feet. So you can easily make it up to the top. So you all see Ma'ak bolt up the dune. And this is the first time I think probably any of you may have seen a Thrykreen um, run full out across the desert. And as he does it, his body elevates up. So where he was typically seven feet tall... He now becomes easily nine feet tall as his lower, as his feet and then his middle appendages, which you typically took for arms, suddenly go down and become feet. And he raises up and he begins to just skirt the ground, just barely touching the sand. And you can see these little uh, uh, puffs of sand come up off the ground as he starts to just race up the dune. What are the rest of you doing? I am assuming he is running away from something and I'm going to follow. (laughs) Okay, so you, are you going to do the same um, times five movement? Oui. Okay, what does that, what does that make you um, in terms of? Sixty you're losing ground real fast. I mean, he is way out ahead of you uh, as he goes flying up that hill. Boast, what is Boast doing? Well, seeing as how the others are moving in that other direction, I feel like I should follow. I, I draw my sword and I begin trying to run after. Okay, and are you going to do your full out run as well? Well, I, I don't want to leave Zarn behind, so I, I look to Zarn and then point to my shoulder. Do you, should I carry you again? Yeah. I, and I lift Zarn up, and then uh, and then I try to move as quickly as I can. Basically, you can keep pace with Desi, and you start running up, but Ma'ak is at the peak of the dune long before the rest of you. As you get up to that peak, you can see the Sand Howler bounding away um, down the dune and uh, already up the next dune, um, perhaps about 50 yards away. The dunes kind of compress and get close now. Can I try to hit him with my shortbow? Yeah. Um, As you crest the hill, you can see it. You can't make out... You can just make out this dim shape bounding up the dune, the next dune. So go ahead and give me your attack roll. Eighteen. Eighteen. Okay, yeah, you hit it. Yeah, you, you're, you're in the dark, and, and it's the, the twin moons of Athos shining, casting that blue light, and you just see the form. You grab your short bow out, pull the arrow, and just let it go, and you see that black, that black line sail through the sky, and Ma'ak, you, see, you, you, you hear the sound of the air as this dark just slit fly is whistling through the air out toward the sand howler and connect so give me dam- give me your give me your damage roll six okay so you hit it and you hear this howl at which point it begins to howl again i'll dampen that sound mac of five ten there is this solitary moment where it goes Ugh! And then it's just this, this, this just vague, muffled sound out there on the op, the opposing doom, and the sound does not travel. Bust. Anything you're doing? And where am I now in, in relation to Mock? You're at the top of the dune. Zarn has just used his psionic, and you just heard. The, the sound, the sharp reduction in sound of the howler as it begins to howl um, and then suddenly gets cut, cut off and dampened. And you can just see out on the, on the opposing dune, 
about 50 yards away, that creature still bounding away from you and the rest of the group. Do I think that there's any potential that uh, I might catch up with the with the howler or is this a lost cause? Um you think that maybe if you were to put Zarn down and just go all out, you could race it down. It might take a few rounds to get there. Uh but you think you could do it if you go all out. I look to Zarn and I say, I think I can catch it, but I have to put you down. Do what must be done. I do it and then I just begin booking uh, as quickly as I can after it. You put them down and you start to race out across the sands. Uh, At this point, the Sand Howler has crested the dune opposite. So your second shot that you would normally get, Desi, um, you lose your potential to do it. And for Ma'ak, you could keep running forward if you wanted to alongside Boast. But Boast um, is all out. And you are able to crest the next dune in just a single round. You're closing ranks on the Howler. And you catch up to it. Give me an attack. Okay. Well, I let out a <laughs> a series of uh, chits and chitters of excitement as I pounce on this thing. I basically leap 50 feet forward in one motion with my powerful legs and pounce on this thing's back with four claws and one bite attack. Let's see. My claws are a Thacko 13, three and a six, probably not going to hit. And then a six and a five, which don't hit. Um, And then a bite. Just my one bite. The bite's a four. You run up, and every time you try to slash at it, it's a step ahead. You come down on it. You hit it scaly back. Um, You uh, pause. It gets two steps ahead. Um, Boast. Give me your attacks. I roll a 16. So you hit. What's your Thacko? Thacko is 16. Yeah, you hit easily. So I roll the damage with my Obsidian Bastard Sword, which is... 6 plus 8, 14. It, it, it yelps in pain, but it only comes out at the, as this, like... <gasps> it's just this, like, kind of intake of air that you just barely hear um, uh, because of the, the muffling that uh, Zarn did on it. Now that we are basically past this survival check, it does turn to defend itself now um, feeling that it is cornered. So actually everybody give me uh, initiatives. I assume Boast is going to continue using the Bastard Sword? Yes. Okay, so give me your initiative. 1d10. Uh, One person. Who's going to roll initiative for the party? We can let Boast roll. Okay, so Boast roll initiative for the party and then we will modify based on your attack. So, Boast is going to use uh, the Bastard Sword. Ma'ak, what are you going to do? All right. Well, since I wasn't able to land a hit on it, I'm going to give up on my natural attacks, let it run past a little bit. I'm just going to stop in my tracks, pull out my uh, two throwing wedges, and I'm going to hurl them both. Okay. And then Desi, what is she going to do? I think I'm too far away to use anything but the short bow. The short bow, you need to make your way up to the top of the dune to get eyesight. So no, you would have to move your full movement to get up to the top of the dune at this point. Zarn, they will also need to use their full movement to get to the top of the dune. Yeah, that's what I'll do. So both give me your give me the initiative roll for the party. I rolled a one. So it's going to be a seven. Ma'ak? I'm pulling out my chachkachas. Uh, my throwing wedges, uh, they have a speed factor of four. Four. Okay. So that's a five. So Desi and Zarn, the two of you crest the hill. Looking down, you can see um, at the base of uh, between two wave dunes, uh, you can see the three. Uh, Ma'ak, Boast, and the Sand Haller engaged. The Sand Haller has actually stopped charging and has turned and is engaged in the group. The Sand Howler strikes out at Bust. 
and it comes in and it hits with force um, as it bites deeply doing four points of damage and then it also swipes at you with two claws what's your AC? six with both claws it does three more points of damage Um, and uh, uh, at the top of the dune you can see the sand howler um, uh, just lay in to boast uh, biting him and then ravaging him with both claws you also have to now give me a paralyzation save as you stare into its eight black opal eyes and this mesmerizing effect begins to take over I roll a twenty you stand firm as you feel as you feel it try to claw its way into the back of your brain but it can't reach Uh, at which point Ma'ak what do you do when I see the sand howler bite down uh, so savagely on Boast, um, I will basically stay within three yards of the creature. I don't want to get any closer, but that's the short range on my throwing wedges. And so I'm going to hurl two attacks in the traditional uh, style of my pack uh, over under and throw two of these throwing wedges at it. Um, eh, and I roll a 14 and a nat 20. 20 points of damage total. Uh, you throw both chatkachas, and uh, the first one is the one that does it. The second one is just overkill. First one embeds itself directly between the eyes and the snout, drops the creature. The second one buries itself deeply into the side of the creature as it lays on its side, and its blood runs out onto the sand. You know, however, that uh, after the first howl, uh, you don't have long before the rest of the pack arrives. So you need to vacate the, the area as quickly as you can. I will pull the creature off, boast, haul him up on his feet. I gather them up and I push them along. Kind of um, like a, like a, almost like a herd dog, you know, just keeping pace with the slowest of them because that's the best I can do. Is uh, Zarn going to ha- hop back up on both shoulders? Yeah, I, I'm just going to start running. And I'll try to pick him up uh, in the mid-sprint. As Zarn begins to run, uh, Boast comes up behind and, and scoops them up by you know his massive arm and puts you right back up on uh, his shoulder where uh, they were to begin with. And uh, uh, off you go into the night. Um, And as you run down the dune and up the next, uh, you can hear far, far in the distance the corresponding howls of the pack as they, well, as uh, Ma'ak, you hear the telltale signs of them trying to locate their pack mate. Uh, and you basically don't stop, don't stop, keep going off into the night. You can make a couple more hours. You can get basically to midnight before the group of you are exhausted. Um, well, not the group of you, but at least Desi and Zarn, uh, have to stop, um, and rest. And you know, also, uh, Ma'ak, you need your few hours to be able to meditate, recover your um, psionics. Boast, you could have kept going for another two days, probably. But you know that uh, for the sake of the group, you need to pause um, and rest. Uh, Is there anything that you guys want to do? You know that at this point you're probably safe from the pack of sand howlers um and uh ma'ak you do 
you do what the Thrykreen typically do when they are uh, evading predators in the open tablelands, in the sandy wastes, um, covering your tracks, heading back, creating false tracks, so on and so forth. Because I can probably literally run circles around these guys, that's probably not that big a deal for me to do, like, as I'm constantly disappearing and reappearing and making false tracks and that kind of stuff. The other thing I will try to do, once I feel like I've um, covered our tracks, so to speak, um, I want to seek for some kind of shelter. I don't know if a cave is possible, but even an overhang of rock to keep us out of the wind, uh, something like that. Uh, a place where these sleepers can rest. Give me a survival check. And I make it by two. There is, in the region that you're heading, what is known as a star dune. Star dunes are the most interesting. They're twisted masses of sand with tentacle-like ridges extending in all directions. Sometimes for many miles, they form in areas where winds from many directions meet, causing the dune's radial arms to twist back on itself. They change shape slowly and seldom move far. They serve well as landmarks and seas of shifting sands. In the Dune region, the traveler occasionally hears a vibrant, booming echo across the sands. This muffled thunder usually continues for five minutes or more, and can be so loud that you must shout to make yourself heard. Druids and clerics explain this roaring by saying that it is caused by avalanches of sand tumbling down the steep faces of the dunes. But before you, there is a giant star dune, and within its maze-like uh, thread of, tenta- uh, uh, of sands reaching out like the tentacles of some great um, aberrant creature, um, you are able to find Uh, packed dunes with ledges overhanging enough that you think perhaps you might find some shade in the sun the next day. That is where we will make camp. I will probably start setting about in the Thrykreen way of making camp and uh, and look around curiously realizing that no one else is helping me. Um, Anybody else want to join in um, to help Ma'ak create the shelter? Yeah, I can use heat protection as well. If there should be any kind of materials around here that I could use, um, I have carpentry, but I suppose it's just sand and sand around here. If you were in another region like Stony Barrens, um, Rocky Badlands, you might have more. If you had a source of water, of course, or even mud, uh, like, you know, uh, uh, unpotable water, you could probably help out a little bit more. The group of you working together, uh, I will say based on your your inherent skills, are able to cobble together basically what amounts to a ledge that you could hunker up against and protect yourselves from the direct line of the sun in the coming day. Here in this star dune, um, you're uniquely protected from the elements just based on the way that the dune itself has developed naturally, spreading out like spokes on a wagon wheel, um, but in this kind of snaking pattern that kind of winds back on itself. And what that does is it creates windbreaks. Um, and so, uh, uh, that's, that's one of the things that makes that as far as Ma'ak can tell you, uh, makes the star dune sort of stable in the desert. They are unlikely to shift the way that a wave dune or what is also considered a mechalot dune, which you have not encountered yet, but is a massive dune formation. Um, do not are not affected, you know, which are affected by the winds 
unlike a star dune so um here you think that what you've managed to create should protect you if you want to continue to wait out the heat of the day travel at night oh we're going to become nocturnal it is perhaps the best way to travel here mm. until we have replenished our water supply we need to conserve it yeah in the sandy dunes, in the wastes out here, it is very, very difficult to find water. While you rest, I will go seek some. Uh, if perhaps you find any berries, uh, bring them back. I can, I can maybe help sustain us a little bit longer. Berries. Hmm. I do not. My people do not typically eat berries, but I will forage for them if I can. With a little magic, maybe you'll uh, change your mind. Is Bost injured? That I am, yes. I have taken uh, quite a nasty bite, and uh, I've been trying to take care of it as best as I can, but I don't have anything with me, really. I go over and. I put my hand on your wound and I start to mutter to myself and uh, you feel a warmth emitting from Zarn's hand. I'm casting Cure Light Wounds. But with Zarn's methodology of casting the spell... When they cast the spell upon your wounds, flame erupts from the the wound itself, cauterizing it in this painful burst of searing light and heat before it burns off and the smoke releases into the sky and as it burns away, all that is left is just a small scar. The, un the unique aspect of the fire cleric being they always leave scars. Well, that will go nicely with the other scars that I have. This is your first free scar, though. Treasure it. Your words are very true. I am free now, am I not? Yes, I am. Thank you. Ma'ak will mutter a word under his breath as he observes this. Ulkrik. Ulkrik. And nod very approvingly. I could be completely off base, but I'm wondering, that thing we killed, you move so fast... Is there any chance you could retrieve it and we could eat it? Uh, actually, do I know if sand howlers are good eating, Aaron? Um, anything is good eating if you have to. Basically, of all of the things in the desert, the kanks would be the last choice for anything. So even a sand howler is good eating, if it's necessary. The question is... Um, you are loath to go back to a, the place where you are certain the pack will be congregating. Right, and I spent all that time covering our tracks. I'd basically just be re-leading them to us. Ma'ak turns to Desi, and in his language, which he knows you understand, he will basically say, I will feed you, but not that. When I feel like I... I mean, obviously... I'm abandoning them, these poor, you know, sleepers out here in the desert. I've done my best to make them safe, but, you know, I, I sooner or later I'm going to have to leave them. So as long as I think they're as safe as I can make them, um, then I will leave. But if I think there's any chance that they might uh, alert something else out here to their position or whatever, I'm probably not going to be going very far, to tell you the truth. So give me a, give me a water fine check. I make it by one. Oh, I only make it by one. Okay. So you head out into the desert to the... Uh, you end up heading towards the west. And from where you are, 
uh, you end up having to crest a mechalot dune where there is strong wind steady wind blowing from one direction the dunes are called mechalot dunes this is because of their great size and shape, which resembles the hump of a mechalot's back, stretching anywhere from one half to several miles in length and lying parallel to the path of the wind. These dunes often rise as high as 750 feet and can seem like mountains, especially if you happen to be the unlucky fellow who must cross a couple of hundred miles of them on foot. Luckily, Ma'ak must only cross one of them. And as you crest this massive 500-foot dune of pure, soft, silty sand... And you gain the peak. You look down and you can see perhaps half a mile distance, maybe three quarters. There appears to be some massive plant formation. And in the glint of the twin moons, you can just see the silvery sheen of a mass of liquid in the very center of this vegetative outgrowth. So, Maak, now that you have seen this potential oasis, what do you do? Maak attempts to contain his excitement um, because he knows that while this uh, could be life-saving, water attracts life, both predator and prey. And he does not wish to become prey today. Certainly something like this is not going to be uninhabited, and it would be foolish to assume it is unguarded. So he will very slowly, very carefully, begin to make his way closer uh, towards uh, what he thinks is this oasis and vegetation, looking for any signs of life or movement. Um, and uh, he will probably not get within more than a quarter mile. Normally, Thrykreen, when we do scouting missions like this, we're going to be supported by at least two other members of the Clutch. Right now, it's just me, and I know that that is dangerous to go off alone let alone uh, unsupported in dangerous place like this give me a sandy waste survival check I miss by one I miss by one okay so you get within about a quarter mile of the phenomenon the oasis and you can't see any movement uh, the twin moons of uh, Athos are high in the sky at this point the wind is chill. Temperature has probably dropped down to um, a brisk 50 degrees Fahrenheit. You can just see that silvery gleam reflecting off of that pool uh, in the center of this thicket, which now you can determine is perhaps a half a mile across. Wow, that's a big oasis then. Well, the that pool is much, much smaller. Maybe a couple dozen, few dozen yards at the center of the thicket itself. Um, but all around, you see, is, is a, a dense tangle of bramble. You're probably about three or four hours out from the camp. Ma'ak would love to be courageous and uh, provide for his new friends, but he can't do them any good if he gets ambushed and die. Here alone. So he is going to mark this place and backtrack towards the uh, star dune. Actually, I will backtrack, but I will double back to see if anything is trailing me. Do you have hunting? I do indeed. 
Okay, give me a hunting check. I make it by 14. You do not see any evidence that anybody's been tracking you. Of course, as you do turn and head back towards where your companions have uh, camped for the night, you do notice in the sand, there's lots of trails leading toward the thicket. Just footprints, paw prints. There's Erdlu, there's Kank, um, and then there's stuff that's not quite identifiable. Um, but lots of common, you know, sort of hunting beasts uh, that you're familiar with. I don't want to go back empty-handed. I will hang out for like an hour or so and see if I can bring back an Erdlu or something like it that's returning in that hour, you don't see anything come your way from the oasis. Okay, well, I'd like to be able to get back to the camp and then get them here before sunrise. Do I think that's possible? Yeah, if you double time it, um, you can definitely get back there to the camp fairly easily. You were just being, you know, semi-cautious as you were making your way, looking for water, moving basically about half speed. But now you can... Uh, follow your trails back. Uh, of course, about halfway, the wind has pretty much obscured your route. So give me a survival check. Oh, yeah, I nail it. I make it by eight. It's pretty easy once you get back to the top of the Mechalot dune. Um, you can see out beyond. And from this height, you can see the crest of that star dune where the others are camped. And you can get back there relatively in a short matter of time the rest of you have hunkered down you have created a shelter in basically one of the eaves of this star dune i assume that you are all resting for the night but tell me exactly what you were doing is there any conversation you want to have uh are you preparing for the next day we should probably have watches make sure no one sneaks up on us Especially with all those elves out there. Have you done this before? Have you been in the wild before? There's a lot of, a lot of beasts. And even when there aren't, there's always the threat of man. I look at my uh, freshly healed uh, wound, and I look back to the two of uh, them, and I say, oh, Yes, we, we must have watch us. The desert is dangerous, it seems. Somehow the slave pits seem safer. I can take the first watch. You best get some sleep. I would try. <laughs> you you have never experienced anything like this, Desi. This is discombobulating, but you're in company. You're not utterly isolated, and hearing, just hearing them talk comforts so you keep that anxiety at bay even though it, it does it does sit there it, it niggles at you a little bit i tell you what i'm going to do i'm going to put i'm going to make sure they are both on either side of me i am between them and then i'm going to tell myself stories until i can sleep okay are you going to tell those stories to inside your head or are you going to tell them out loud I'm going to tell them out loud. It is about uh, the creative and the destructive force, and then the storyteller, and the storyteller manifests in the stories. And one time, he manifests in the stories, but he f decides he likes it so much that there he remains in the story, and he remains until he forgets that he is an element and he builds a life here, and he falls in love with the life, he falls in love with the story, he falls in love with the characters, and then it, it falls on the god of creation and destruction, this great life force, to come back to the storyteller and remind him that he is not in the story, but the creator of the story. I will not tell the whole thing now, but that is what the story is about. So you can listen as Desi regales you with this story of of the creator and its relationship to the elements of Athos, I assume. And any time fire is mentioned, uh, Zarin, you, you, 
you peek up a little bit. But really what it does is, Boast, you said you were taking first watch? That's right. Yeah, I'm taking the first watch. For you, story was so important in the arena because it was really the only diversion that existed. And when you weren't training and you weren't fighting and you weren't spilling blood and you weren't angling and jockeying for position, worrying, looking over your shoulder, in those few moments that you got, uh, story was so important. And so uh, you become wrapped uh, by the tale that she tells. Zarn, you drift right off. Just drift right off and, and, and let the sands envelop you. And some of those images follow you into your dreams. The night gets colder and colder and you pull your blankets tight around you. Basically, you know, as you all set up for camp and Desi begins to tell her story, you're, you're nearing dawn. So you, uh, Boaster, bas- you basically keep watch until the sun begins to rise in the east. And <clears throat> then you can wake up uh, whoever is next. Uh, Desi tells her story and then she drifts right off. Uh, Ma'ak still has not yet returned. So who is going to be next in that uh, watch procession? I'll be next. Then I wake up Zarn. So you wake up Zarn, and Bust, you are able to... You have that warrior's ability to just fall asleep instantly. Uh, Any moment that you would get in the arena to sleep, it came to you instantly. And so you close your eyes and you're out. Zarn, you wake up and... It's just in time for the blazing dark sun to begin to rise, and you feel that energy come into you. And yeah, I I, I watch as as the light of the dark crimson sun rises over the horizon and starts to dance across the sands of the sandy wastes, and I I. I take some in my hand and let it fall between my fingers so I can remind myself of the the cold that is about to become eradicated by the sun and the fire. Uh, Yeah, it's beautiful. You have listened to an episode of Red Moon Roleplaying, where we played the scenario A Little Knowledge for Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition and the Dark Sun setting. This has been a collaboration with our friends at the podcast Adventure Hook. Do check out the link in the show notes to get tons of new ideas for your game. Our Dungeon Master was Aaron Campbell, and Matthias was joined by Robert Randall, Amadeo Torturo, and Emily O'Hara. The music was made by Ager Sonis, and was used with permission from their label, Cryo Chamber. Check out their website at cryochamber.bandcamp.com or their YouTube channel for some moody dark ambient for your gaming table. We would like to give massive thanks to our champions of the Red Moon. Martin Hoshobert, Nastasha Rollerson, Simon Cooper, David, Julia, Camilla, and Ludwig Manford for their generous support. And we would of course also like to thank all of our other patrons. Without your support, the show would not be possible. If you want to support our work, please check us out on Patreon. You can get access to bonus campaigns for Cult of Indie Lost and Coriolis there, as well as get early and raw access to all of our recordings. You can also hear your name read on the show as a champion of the Red Moon, as well as play Cult with us. But most importantly, that support is what keeps the show going, so do check us out there. Thank you again for listening, and remember, water is life.